we're, we're recording now, so... Well, it's a very interesting moment in history right now. The new President Obama has just taken office, and we know that he's a great dancer. He's made all the right moves in the early days of his presidency. And I think everyone is hoping that he'll have a very beneficial effect on international relations, and particularly international understanding. But the whole question of international understanding, I think, is much more complex than what meets the eye. And I think the new president will have his work cut up for him. I think he's going to be obviously a huge improvement over George W. Bush, for whom the Taliban were a heavy metal rock band before he found out otherwise. And, uh, of course, a huge improvement over the likes of Sarah Palin, who thought that Africa was one country rather than 53 countries. Uh, what worries me is that Washington and all of the people who will be working with Obama and with his presidency will be doing their best to be thoughtful. Uh, but I'm worried about this thoughtfulness being of a certain sort. If you go to Washington and you go down the avenues that radiate off DuPont Circle, all the buildings, uh, one think tank after another. And you would have thought that with all of this amount of intellectual effort, something decent by way of foreign policy would come out of Washington. But all of these think tanks, whether from a conservative or a neoconservative or from a liberal point of view, are dealing with the world from an American perspective. And they're dealing with trying to understand the world in terms of American interests. Now, the world is understood as something that is related to the United States of America. And what concerns me is whether or not the world will ever be understood in itself, um, for itself. And not just understood in terms of what the policies of the individual countries of the outside world are to do with it but understood in terms of how the thinking behind those policies originated. So that's why I wanted to write this book. It was very, very much uh, in response to my Washington friends and the long debates that uh, we've had uh, traveling around the world doing absolutely extravagant and stupid things and very often accompanying them as they've been doing wrong things in their diplomatic duties, wrong at least from my perspective, because of the lack of understanding of thought that goes behind other people's, other countries' foreign policies. It's almost as if the rest of the world is reduced to a bunch of pictograms. And what you've got here in my study here at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies, are a collection of Oriental calligraphies. And you've got here at the bottom by my table here a poem that's written in Chinese. It's actually quite bad calligraphy. This was done by my father when he was trying to learn how to do this kind of thing. Uh, but we have other examples of, if not calligraphy, then efforts to render the symbolism and the pictograms behind calligraphy more, as it were, related to everyday life. So you have a painting here by the New Zealand artist Patrick Hanley, uh, trying to give uh, a sense of humanity's relationship with heaven, with the spirit world uh, in heaven. And this is derived, in fact, from an exercise that Patrick undertook in terms of playing with trying to render pictures out of Chinese calligraphy. Just a bit further up, again, the New Zealand artist, Philip Blair, has rendered a tree uh, in the manner of a Chinese calligraphy character except that the word for tree in Chinese looks nothing like that, and what Philippa has done looks much more like the Chinese character for moon. Uh, it's when you get out of the territory of just trying to find the picture, the immediate symbol behind the Chinese word, that you start running into serious problems. For instance, the top piece of calligraphy was done by a master for me in Tokyo, uh, Master Mita. He was a master not only of calligraphy, but also of karate. And that word means perseverance. It means endurance. It means fortitude. And if you pan over to this other piece of calligraphy here, done by an Okinawan master, 
uh, Master Toma, again a master not only of calligraphy but of karate. And this piece of work, this word, this piece of calligraphy means integrity, it means pure heart, and it means the fortitude to maintain integrity. It means having a strong heart on behalf of something. Now, when you look at the concepts that are embedded in terms of integrity, in terms of perseverance, in terms of fortitude, there's no way that you can have a picture that expresses something which has a complex moral meaning, which comes out of complex Confucian systems of thought that spread all over East Asia. And the idea of simply saying, look, this means something and that's the meaning, end of story, neglects to try to uncover the traditions behind why it's important to have integrity. There's a genealogy here. To have integrity, you have to have a strong heart. To have a strong heart, you have to have patience. To have patience, you have to have persistence. You have to have endurance. And embedded in that is that if you're going to maintain your endurance, you've got to have defiance. What is at stake in the world right now are a whole series of cascading episodes of defiance against not being understood by the great Western powers. This is what the book's about. It's trying to explain how people think and how in the processes of thinking they arrived at a condition of defiance which they think is morally justified and comes out of the pure wellsprings of a moral position against the political encroachment. So what I'm at pains to do in this book is not to say this is what the Iranian government thinks or this is what Osama bin Laden thinks. That's relatively easy to do even if it becomes much misunderstood. What I'm at great pains to point out in this book is how do the Iranians think? How does Osama bin Laden think? And that's been done by trying to read the very works that they themselves grew up with. If Osama bin Laden is a fundamentalist, fleeing from the Americans, hiding somewhere in a Pakistani cave with 3,000 books, why does it take 3,000 books to make a fundamentalist? Or is there something going on here that we're not clued up about. And why does no one in the West, who is an enemy in a thoughtful way of Osama bin Laden, bother to read those 3,000 books? It's to try to break out of that impasse uh, that I wrote this book. The second really great difficulty, of course, of writing this book was to try to write it so it could be understood by a normal, non-academic, non-scholarly audience. So hopefully it's written in a way that if you can fight your way through the Sunday supplements, you can fight your way through those before you get to the comic pages and the sports pages over your cup of coffee and croissant early in the morning, then it's a book for that kind of person on a Sunday morning with a big steaming mug of coffee wanting to find out something about the world and maybe wanting to find out something about the world just a little bit ahead of the new President Obama and his discovery of just how hard it's going to be to have thoughtful American foreign policy.